maybe uh, it's fairly rare, uh, but it does happen sometimes. The, the most common outcome is number two, the borderline, uh, where you have a score of somewhere between 70 and 84 average. Um, and that's the, that's the instance when your committee wants to sit down with you and talk to you about, um, you know, this, these are the problems that we see with it. Uh, this is some areas of strength. These are some areas of weakness. Um, and then basically your committee and you uh, establish a timeline for when to do, you know, how much time you get to have uh, to resubmit it. Um, so you'll basically resubmit it with some good feedback from your committee. Um, and then the, the third option, which occasionally happens, but not tons, I would say probably less than 5% of the time, uh, is a clear fail where your score is 69 or below. And um, then your committee does, uh, it, it says no, no oral exam needed. I need to, I'm sorry, that should have said oral exam needed. It's not an exam, it's more of just a meeting at that point where um, we sit down with you and say, you know, this is why it was unacceptable. Uh, and you get two chances to take the comps. Um, so you'd have to take it the next semester that it's offered. Uh, and that would involve paying a $50, what's called a continuous enrollment fee. And it just basically continues to give you access to your email, gives you access to the library. But again, that's kind of the rarity. So maybe 10% of people get a clear pass, maybe 5% of people or fewer get a clear fail, but the bulk, you know, like 85% or so of folks generally fall into the borderline. We'd like to see that number of clear passes go up, hence why I'm having this meeting with you all is that we're trying to make it a little bit more clear what you can expect um, and, you know, you know, what we'd like to see. So we'd love to see that clear pass number. I'd love to see it go to more than 50%. Um, so that's my two cents. Any questions about like what happens after you submit your uh, papers? So do we, do we submit the paper to all three people? Yeah, that uh, Dr. Eckenrod Green might put different instructions in the email. Okay. So just carefully look at her instructions. Okay. But that's typically how it's done is that, you know, when you finish it, you you send an email to all three people on your committee and mm -hmm. attach the two papers. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, so this next page is plagiarism. Do we really need to talk about it? <laughs> Um, I'm hoping that we don't really need to talk about plagiarism. Uh, plagiarism, if, uh, it, if it pops out, and we do do things like, you know, if there's a, a phrase that we're like, huh, that's a really, that's really different from how they're writing the rest of their paper, we'll copy and paste the phrase into Google and it will show up if it's plagiarized. So it's pretty easy to do something like that and pretty easy to find a plagiarism. So if, if that were to happen, which I'm not at all saying that that would happen, any of you, um, uh, that would be an automatic fail because uh, that's you know pretty egregious uh, at this level uh, for that to happen. Um, and just to clarify, uh, if you quote something verbatim, in other words, take it word for word from some source, you need to cite it with the page numbers. If you are just paraphrasing an author's ideas, you do need to tell us who the author is and what year it was, but you don't have to give page numbers because you're not giving us a verbatim quote. Any questions about that one? Um, Dr. Robbins told me that um, it wasn't uncommon for some of these papers to have, um, you know, paragraphs where almost every sentence was, um, had a, you know, a citation yeah. at the end of it. So yeah. she said, uh, for me being um, a history major before this, I, uh, that was really weird to me because I would make statements and then back them up with mm -hmm. research. Yeah. And so here it was more like um, I was making statements about the research throughout the entire paper. Does that make right. sense? Yes, yes. Uh, so I think probably the, the way to err in this case is to put it into your own words unless it is so beautifully phrased by the author that you couldn't possibly put it into your own words without diminishing it somehow. Um, and so, you know, so some, if, if you, if it's just kind of like a banal statement, like, you know, the sky is blue, you know, you can somehow change that to put it into your own words. But if it's like just so 
mellifluous, I'm using my $20 vocabulary today, but it's just so <laughs> beautifully stated that you just, you know, and it's so succinctly stated or something, that's the only time when I would say to use an actual quote. Um, but what we find sometimes with students is that they pepper quotes throughout a paragraph and you really don't want to do that because that sort of messes with the flow sometimes. Because um, uh, another thing that some people do sometimes is they'll say, this author said this, this author said that, this author said that, and maybe all three authors are kind of saying the same thing. So just kind of put it together to say, you know, multiple researchers have argued that blah, blah, blah. And you're putting it into your own words. And yeah. in, in the citation, you say, you know, Morrison, 2017, Robbins, 2016, and, you know, whatever other author and, and you know, alphabetize them by last name. Um, but yeah, so you're, we're really wanting to hear your scholarly voice and less so other scholarly voice. Your voice is building on the others' voices. Okay. Let me move on here. All right, so here's, um, and this is my advice for how I approach writing any particular topic. So everybody sort of has their own procedure, I guess, but this is what I recommend, is once you find out the topic, do a lot of pre-writing. In other words, do a lot of reading on the subject first in reputable sources, and look for multiple perspectives on an issue, as I mentioned before, anticipate arguments. Um, take notes of the things that you read and make sure that you get the citation information down. Like back in the olden days, when I was first like in high school and college, the way that we did research was, you know, we'd find these various sources, we'd read them and we'd take notes on index cards. At the top of the index card, we would have the citation information and then we'd have some like interesting quotes or interesting pieces of information or a summary or something like that. Nowadays with uh, you know the advent of technology, um, index cards might not be the way to go. What I do oftentimes is if I get articles or something online and I have them as a PDF, you know there's a feature where you can go in on a PDF and highlight sections. So I might do that and so I have like maybe you know 10 or 15 articles that I've read and highlighted various pieces and then after I've done all of this reading I kind of have a general sense in my mind of you know categories of things and so then um, you know I, I might make an outline to, you know uh, with points of commonalities um, but that's kind of what we're looking for we're not looking for like in like you know here's a paragraph on this study here's a paragraph on this study uh, but it's more of pulling things together seeing where the commonalities are and the really the only way you can do that is by first reading a lot and then thinking about writing so that that research piece is something i think that a lot of people read a little bit then they write a little bit then they read a little bit then they write a little bit and that tends to make things be a little bit too choppy at least that's been my experience over 13 years. Um, another part of the pre-writing is to outline. Uh, you're going to get an instruction from Dr. Eckenrod Green that you have to submit an outline um, with your final paper. And the reason for this is um, we started noticing that it seemed that people were not planning out their writing. Um, there would be repetition of sections. Um, and there would be kind of, there wasn't like a logical flow. So we are asking to see proof that you're outlining before you're writing. It really is a pretty integral step. Um, and so uh, do make an outline, but I know some people also they write their paper and then they make their outline. Don't do that. <laughs> plan your outline to help you plan your writing. Um, and in some of the questions, or either one of the questions that you get, in the past, like we've posed a question like, you know, uh, should schools buy laptops for their computers? That might be the question for the core, core courses. And um, we would have a series of sub questions to kind of get people's thinking going. And what people would do is they would sort of take that as a Q&A. They would write their paper and organize it around those sub questions. And we're like, what? You know, there's repetition here because sometimes the sub questions are similar. So whatever you do, if you get sub questions to your main question, do not use them as your outline. 
those are food for thought. They're just to get you thinking around things. So you might want to like, you know, after you write your outline, you might want to go back to the question and any sub questions that are provided to see, have I covered all of this somewhere? But don't treat any sub questions as if they should be sub subheadings because that's not what they're there for, okay? And when you're writing your core course question, um, we're also going to ask for another supplemental piece of information. We're going to ask you to um, just have like a, a paragraph explaining how did you apply your research skills? How did you apply what you learned in your multicultural class? How did you apply what you learned in your technology class? And how did you apply what you learned in the foundations, the course that you likely had with me? Um, so, because for the core courses question, you know, again, it's been on things like, should we have laptops in school? Uh, should we let kids use cell phones in school? Um, should there be homework uh, that teachers assign? This very big topic issues. Um, so, you know, you would write a paragraph saying, you know, I use my skills of 605 because in 605 it taught me how to find reputable resources. It taught me about how to be concise in my writing. Um, and, you know, this is evidence through my reference list. This is evidence through, you know, you, you might, you know, point us to certain things. The 605, the research class should come out overall. Um, the multicultural class, you would say, um, you know, when answering this question about whether or not I should give homework, you know, you see in my paper that I took into consideration that there are some kids who don't have uh, you know, an educated parent at home, or I took into consideration that some kids' parents are working uh, in the evening and wouldn't be able to help out with homework. So you're showing, you know, you're somehow pointing out to us, hey, look, I've learned in 670 that there are lots of different populations of students, and I need to take that into consideration whenever I make any kind of um, statements or recommendations about anything related to education. Um, as far as 620, the, uh, the technology class, again, you'd have a paragraph where you said, you know, notice uh, that I, you know, drew in issues of technology or, or other concepts that I learned in 620. And then for 607, the topics that we covered in there are things like, what's the purpose of education? How do we fund schools? What are current political policies going on with education? Um, so what I would recommend is that you maybe in the next couple of days before you get your questions, maybe review those four classes. Like hopefully you kept the syllabus, hopefully you kept maybe some readings or your reading responses for, for my class in particular. Just reviewing them to, to, you know, just to refresh yourself on what those courses uh, were meant to teach you. Um, if you didn't keep that material, uh, one thing that you could do is to go to the registrar's webpage and you can pull up what are called official course descriptions. And they don't give you a syllabus, but they kind of give you stuff that this is what was covered in this class. Um, because we who, who teach it, we have to abide by that official course uh, description, but then we can tweak it and put in you know, our own assignments and stuff. So if you're like, oh crap, I threw all that stuff away, or I, my apartment flooded or something like that, and I don't have those materials, um, you can go to the registrar's website to get some information about what the class was meant to teach. So that was a lot of information. Questions on, on this piece? Okay, I'll move along. And, and uh, so, if, again, if you have any questions, just let me know. Hello, spouse. <laughs> My husband just came in. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, all right, I covered that one. Whoops, sorry, going too far that way. All right, so now we're at the point, you've done all this reading, you've prepared your outline, you've thought about how am I gonna tie in the four core questions, and you only have to do that for that question that at this point you have no idea what the topic is. Uh, when you're talking about the one that you had some say in the topic, you don't have to talk about bringing in the core courses, um, but you do have to do an outline. You do have to submit an outline for that one. Okay, so now we're ready to write. Um, uh, again, these are just basics writing tips. Have a clear and engaging introduction, and we would especially love for you to kind of lay out not so much a central thesis, but a central argument, and like uh, um, 
some path you know where you're going you know what's going to come first